The Churches of Christ present Bible Talk. There are many important questions which one must answer as we travel along life's pathways, some more significant than others. I don't know of a more significant question which all must answer than the question, where will you spend eternity? We'll break this question down and examine it on our program today. But before we do that, let's sing a song of praise to God. As always, I want to begin by thanking you for being a supporter of our program. If you were not tuning in, there would be no occasion for us to be on the air, and we're often encouraged by the responses that you send in to us. I also want to take this opportunity, as I always do, to thank you for opening up your homes and allowing me to bring to you another message from God's inspired Word. As already mentioned, there are so many important questions that one must answer in this life the most important ones being spiritual in nature. Some of the great spiritual questions that come to mind are, am I saved? Or, what must I do to be saved? Or perhaps, how do I obey the gospel? Another question of equal importance, and one worthy of our attention in this lesson, is the question, where will you spend eternity? It's a question that everyone must answer, as all will one day leave this life. Hebrews 9.27 is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. Romans 5.12, Paul said, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. What does this question indicate? What can we learn from simply asking this great and important question? Let us examine together this great question today. The question is first a personal question. Notice the question again is, Where will you spend eternity? Sometimes if we're not careful... We get so wrapped up in what someone else is doing, whether or not someone else is living faithfully, and, and what so-and-so is saying, or what, or what some other person may be doing in their life. And if not careful, we can do that to the neglect of our own souls and the examination of our own lives. Remember the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 9.27, when he said, I keep my body under subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul said, before I go about preaching to others, I must keep my body under subjection to the Lord. And then, of course, you think about Matthew 7, where our Lord talked about with what judgment we judge, we shall be judged. And went on to say that we have no right to judge an individual based on their sin when we have sin in our own life. And so we can't go about trying to help others or examining the lives of others at the neglect of examining our own life. So remember that this question is not where will John spend eternity. It's not where will Sarah spend eternity. The question is where will you spend eternity? This question has to be a personal one when you consider that each person must decide for themselves whether or not they'll follow the Lord. One preacher said that eternity will be divided up among the whosoever wills and the whosoever wants. Joshua 24, 15, Joshua said, Choose you this day whom ye will serve whether the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell or the gods of the fathers on the other side of the flood, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua could only make that decision for himself and his house. But then he told each individual, Choose you this day whom ye will serve. Think about Romans 10 and beginning at verse 1 when Paul said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is 
that they might be saved. But they going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Paul said that his most earnest plea in prayer is that Israel, the, the, his Jewish brethren, would accept the gospel and be saved. But they had to submit to the righteousness of God themselves. Paul couldn't do that for them. And then 1 Timothy 2, 4, Paul told Timothy that God would desire all men to come to the knowledge of the truth, but each man must come to that knowledge himself personally. It's a personal question because each individual must decide. But it's also a personal question because each person must then prepare for themselves. In Matthew 25 with the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins, you may remember how that when the bridegroom, when the sound of the bridegroom was coming, the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil. And the wise responded to the foolish by, state, by stating, We cannot, lest we have not enough for ourselves and thee. Go to them that sell and get your oil. And in that is a lesson about the fact that one can only prepare enough for themselves for the coming of the bridegroom, which is a representation of Christ. In truth, friends, mama and daddy cannot prepare for you. Your preacher cannot prepare for you. Your elders, your leaders cannot prepare for you. Your spouse cannot prepare for you. But each individual must make the necessary preparations for eternity in themselves. James 4.10 says, Draw nigh unto God and He will draw nigh unto you. But you have to do that as an individual. James would also say, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, James 4.10, and He shall lift you up. But that must be done individually. And this is a personal question because ultimately each person is accountable for self. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, when you read about the judgment, Paul said, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every man may give an account for the things done in this body, whether it be good or bad. But I'm not going to give an account for the things that you've done in your body, and you're not going to give an account for the things that I've done in mine. But we'll all stand before God, Christ being our judge, being judged by His Word, and will give an account for the actions which we took in our own bodies, being accountable for self. In Ezekiel 18.20, God told Ezekiel that the Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. But the unrighteousness shall be upon the one that commits it. Deuteronomy 24.16, Moses wrote, The Father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death, notice, for his own sin. For his own sin. Friends, when we ask the question, where will you spend eternity? It has to be a personal question because only you can make the decision to follow God. Only you can make the decision to make the necessary preparations for eternity and only you are going to stand before God in judgment and give an account for the things that you've done in your life. And asking and answering this question, we must be careful to not pass it off onto someone else, not to not to avoid making it personal, but rather to ask ourselves, where will I spend eternity? Because only I can decide to follow Jesus, and only I can prepare, and only I will stand in judgment. This question, however, is not just one that's personal, but it's a question of position. Again, the question is, where will you spend eternity? The question itself shows us that there is a position or there is a place where we will be for eternity. Some believe that when you die, you're dead like Rover, dead all over. That is to say that once my life is over, there's just nothing, just worm dirt, some might crudely say. However, the scriptures paint a very different picture as they show us that everyone will spend an eternity somewhere in some position, in some state. And we're really not even left to wonder where that might be for the only two options are clearly laid before us. Remember in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19, Moses said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. The choices have been placed before us. Our Lord has provided to us a means of choosing either life or choosing death. And He loved us enough to give us that choice. But those are our only two options. Those are the only two positions which one may choose, either blessing or cursing, either life or death. One may, if he chooses, to reject Christ, reject His gospel, 
and will therefore spend an eternity in torment or in hell for everlasting ages. A place where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 13.50 says, And shall cast them into the furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's a place of eternal darkness, according to Matthew 25.30. It said that he'd cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a place of eternal fire, as Matthew 3.12 describes it as an unquenchable fire, and Matthew 25.41 as an everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It's a place of no reprieve from the pain. Remember the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16 and how that the rich man begged to Abraham, send Lazarus with just a drop of water that he may cool my tongue. And Abraham responded by saying, He cannot, for there is a great gulf fixed so that those that are on that side cannot come over here and those that are over here cannot go over there. There was no relief. There was no reprieve from the pain and the torment and the suffering which the rich man felt when he entered into eternity. It is a place, friends, without God and any of His goodness. You think about how terrible the world seems at times. We turn on the news, we listen to the radio, and we see violence and chaos and destruction all around. And we think about how terrible this life is. But friends, keep in mind that we're living in a world now where God still has a presence. Where God's people still have a presence. Where we still have an influence. But now you consider when you enter into eternity and you enter into the hell that's uh, prepared for the devil and his angels, there is no presence of God or His people at all. There's no goodness to be found. The word death itself means separation. When we die a physical death, we are separated from this physical life, from our physical bodies. But then there's a second death, a spiritual death, which results in our eternal separation from God. Hell is a place without God and any of His goodness. It's a place that's reserved for the devil and his angels. We've already read Matthew 25, 41, that God had prepared this for the devil and his angels. God did not necessarily prepare hell for us. But make no mistake about it, those who do not know Him, who do not come to Him in humble obedience, who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ nor have obeyed His gospel, will find themselves in the hell prepared for the devil and his angels. But if one will humble himself before God, submitting to His will, obeying the gospel, he may abide in heaven for all of eternity. He may be in an exalted position gathered together with the saints around the throne of God. We read that heaven is a place of comfort, Luke 16. Yes, the rich man was in torment. He had no reprieve from uh, the pain which he was suffering. And yet when you read about Lazarus, he was at Abraham's bosom, at rest and at peace, a place of comfort. You think about how heaven is described as a place without pain, without sorrow, or without death. Revelation 21.4 tells us that there shall be no more pain, no more sorrow. Neither shall there be any more tears for... God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. What an amazing thing to consider that the very hand that painted the universe and all that is therein will reach out and wipe away the very tears from our eyes. Heaven is a place of comfort, a place without pain, sorrow, or death. And it's a place where God is the light. Hell is a place of darkness without the presence of God or any of His goodness. But heaven is a place where God is the light, according to Revelation 21-23. Heaven is a place where we surround the throne of God singing the new song, Revelation 14, 3. I love to sing songs of praise to God here upon the earth. I love to gather together with the saints and sing praises because in many ways that's the closest we can get on this earth to experiencing what heaven will be like. But how I look forward to the day where we're able to gather together with all of the saints in that promised eternity and sing a song which, never, which has never been uttered upon the earth and lift up our voices in praise to God for all of eternity. Heaven is a place reserved for the children of God. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. We have an inheritance uncorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, for the children of God. And we know that heaven is a place of eternal life. Matthew 25, 46. The righteous shall enter life eternal. John three sixteen. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
It is where a crown of life is won. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Revelation 2, 10. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. When this life is over, it's not an end, but rather a beginning of eternity. An eternity in one of these two places, one of these two positions. Where will you spend eternity? It's a personal question, and it's a question of position. And then it's also a question of permanence. Again, the question is, where will you spend eternity? Eternity itself indicates permanence. When something is eternal, it is everlasting. It is lasting forever. Permanent in time. Once heard an illustration of eternity, which still does not exactly do eternity justice, because it still places parameters on something which has no parameters. But this illustration was that a bird carried, a single bird, picked up a single grain of sand, and he carries that single grain of sand from one beach to another. And as the illustration goes, by the time that that bird had carried one grain of sand, or had carried all the sand, rather, from one beach to another, eternity will have just begun. Friends, that's an amazing thing to consider. And it's hard for our minds to really fully comprehend for our lives now are controlled by time, by days, and by seasons. 2 Peter 3, 8. But for something to be eternal, we realize that time is not a factor. In truth, in eternity, time is non-existent. This is a question of permanence because it's permanent in existence. There are those who, for some reason or another, promote an idea that it will only last a little while and then be over. However, such is not the case. We know that this is especially true as it pertains to hell, as some have taken the position that an individual will only suffer for a period of time before their spiritual body is destroyed in hell and therefore they cease to exist. However, the Bible is clear to point out that both the reward and punishment will last for eternity, that is, without end. Such might be the case if we entered eternity in our physical bodies, but we'll enter eternity in a spiritual body. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 and verse 44, notice that Paul said, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So then we know that the spiritual body doesn't age. It's designed to withstand the rigors of eternity, including the punishment of hell. We know that as we enter into eternity, that it will not only be permanent in existence, but permanent in position. Once we've crossed over into eternity, there's no changing the position where we'll find ourselves. Again, in Luke 16, you think about the rich man and Lazarus and how that uh, Lazarus could not cross over to the other side and the rich man could not cross over. They were both bound for all of eternity in the, in the position which they entered into. John 9 and verse 4 reminds us that there is time to work. Our Lord said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. There is a time coming, friends, where no preparations can be made, where no more work for eternity can be done. The only way to change our position in eternity is to change while we yet live here. The question, where will you spend eternity, is a personal one because it asks, where will you spend eternity? The question is one of position because we'll all spend an eternity some way. Where will you spend eternity? And this question is one of permanence as it points out again, where will you spend eternity? eternity, in a place where time is non-existence, where we go on living uh, forever and ever, life without end. Having examined this great question and thinking about it, trying to apply it to ourselves, we must understand that, again, this question must be personal. In truth, we could talk about the sacrifice of our Lord. We could talk about His resurrection. We could talk about the suffering which He suffered upon the earth. We could talk about the many wonderful miracles which He performed confirming His message. We could talk about the establishment of the church in Acts chapter 2 and the great works that were done there. 
We could talk about the apostles and how they took the gospel into the whole world, preaching that Jesus Christ had been dead, buried, and resurrected on the third day. We could study all of those things and make applications from all of them. But in truth, friends, until we make the gospel personal, until we realize that Jesus Christ went to the cross for me, that He suffered for me, that He died for me, that He was raised up from the dead for me, and that He's preparing heaven for me, none of it will ever matter. This question must be asked of individuals personally. Where am I going to spend eternity? If you knew that you would enter into eternity today, where would you spend eternity? And if you have to answer with that place of torment, that place that was prepared for the devil and his angels, wouldn't you change it? If you knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that you were entering into eternity today, wouldn't you change your position while you have opportunity? In truth, friends, there's no way for us to know when we will enter into eternity. But we have the time right now to change. James said, what is your life? It is but a vapor that appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. We only have a limited amount of time to prepare for the bridegroom coming. Learn from the wise and the foolish virgins. Remember that when the bridegroom comes, if we're not prepared, the foolish ran to those that sold the oil. They tried to make their preparations then. And when they came back, the door to the feast had been shut. They knocked and they beat upon that door. I, I picture in my mind them knocking and pleading, begging to come in. And the bridegroom says, Depart, for I never knew you. There will come a time, friends, when we can't prepare, where we won't have the privilege of examining such a question. There will come a time where we won't have the opportunity to ask in this life, where will I spend eternity? But there will come a time where we lift our eyes in eternity and be faced with the question, why did I not prepare for eternity? Won't you make the necessary preparations while you have the time to do so? We see in our Bibles that in order for one to be prepared for eternity, he must have faith. Hebrews eleven six. Without God, it is it, or without faith, it is impossible to please God. We see that repentance must take place. A person must turn away from their sinful practices. Luke thirteen three. I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. One must be willing to confess Jesus Christ with their mouth. Romans ten nine and ten. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And then one must be willing to submit themselves to the watery grave of baptism. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. In Acts 2, 38. When they had been convicted, when their hearts had been pricked, knowing that they had crucified the one whom God had made both Lord and Christ, they cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Peter said in 1 Peter 3.21, The like figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us. We have this life. We have right now to make those preparations. And then once we've done that, let's go on living for Him. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Where will you spend eternity? Thank you again for tuning in, and God bless.
Do you have questions about the Bible? Are you searching for a place to worship God like you find in the Bible? Do you have questions about your eternity? Would you like to know more about God's plan for you? Let me encourage you to visit a church of Christ near you today. If you're interested in learning more about the Lord's Church, we also offer free material. For more information, or if you would like to have a transcript or copy of today's program, whether audio or video, please go to our website at www.bible-talk.org or email us at bible.talk at bible-talk.org. You can also write to us at Bible Talk, P.O. Box 40, Fayette, Alabama, 35555. Simply include the program number, and we will be happy to send that to you completely free of charge. Thank you again for tuning in, and may God bless you richly in your walk with Him. Singing provided by the Edmund Church of Christ, Edmund, Oklahoma, producers of In Search of the Lord's Way. You can visit their website at www.searchtv.org.